Good morning, or good afternoon, and welcome. My name is Phil Tarbox, National Sales Manager for Business Solutions for D-Link in Australia. It's great to have your attendance here at today's session, whether you're catching us live uh, in our Zoom webinar, or if indeed you are catching us via the D-Link Australia and D-Link New Zealand YouTube channel. It's great to have your company here today as we take you through uh, the first of two technical sessions uh, covering the very broad subject of routing. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you the technical presenter for today, Aaron Bilton, pre-sales engineer based in Melbourne. A good morning to you, Aaron. And a good morning to everybody. Yeah, it's great to uh, have you here today. We're looking forward to uh, having some pearls of wisdom that you're going to share with us today. <laughs> Yes. Excellent. Okay, so uh, today's session is being recorded, um, uh, which of course you can catch up uh, on all of the webinars that we've been running during this uh, um, uh, during this COVID period on both the D-Link Australia and the D-Link New Zealand YouTube channels. So these can be found if you just simply go to YouTube, search for D-Link Australia or D-Link New Zealand, uh, uh, click on playlists and then select webinars and you'll find a whole host of webinars that we've been running there. Some technical sessions on wireless, technical sessions on switching. Uh, it's a pretty interesting discussion that we've had there around 4G and 5G and also some introductions to some of our newer products, the Nucleus Connect and Nucleus Cloud uh, range of cloud managed uh, networking solutions which we uh, have to offer and uh, also uh, uh, some uh, product specific presentations that have been there on wireless and also on switching. So I would certainly commend uh, any of those sessions to you to, uh, uh, to go and catch up on any of those webinars at the time that suits you. So during today's session, we will be taking questions. There's a Q and A box uh, in the Zoom client that you may be using. <coughs> So please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our very best to answer those questions during the session uh, today uh, as well. So the more questions, the better. And Aaron, I think when it comes to, uh, um, uh, to sharing and understanding things technical, there's, uh, uh, there's no stupid questions. There's only knowledge to be gained during these sessions. Always better to ask a question. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, Aaron, uh, it's uh, it's over to you. Let's get started. What are we going to be covering today? Okay. Well, welcome to session one out of two. I'll be doing today's session. David and Barna will be doing the second one. And today we are going to cover basics. So we'll do routing basics. We'll go the purpose of a router, DHCP, the local private sides, and reserving. IP addresses via DHCP as well and why we would want to do that. Uh, we'll go through private and public IP addresses and the differences between them. Uh, different types of internet connectivity. Because in Australia, we have a plethora of interesting connections. Uh, internet connectivity with auto failover. We'll go through a few features. Load balancing, how to set up a router's WAN port, opening ports in a router, and I'll show you the DSR series in relation to that. Uh, I'll explain what dynamic DNS service is and why we want it. Uh, SPI, that's uh, part of the firewall side of it. Web content filtering, and I'll show you how we implement it. And then I'll give you a live demo of basically the web GUI and where the options are to set these things. So I'll go through types of DHCP we can set up, including, the, I'll cover a little bit of VLAN there. Uh, different types of WAN setups, because we have uh, quite a few different versions of that as well. Bit of WAN failover, opening ports, and the web content filtering configuration and what to look out for. So I'll get uh, Phil to just uh, go over the uh, partner rewards. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aaron. So um, if anybody that's on here today, uh, whether on, on YouTube or online now, uh, if you are not yet uh, a D-Link partner and a uh, are an IT reseller and its service provider, system integrator, value-added reseller, lots of different names and titles there, then uh, it'd be great to have you join us uh, and to become a D-Link for Business partner. 
Uh, it's very simple to uh, complete a partner application form just done in either one of those two um, website uh, addresses there. Uh, there's some great upfront discounts that's available on our product. You do get access to our priority technical support team, which is based out of our Australian New Zealand head office uh, or support office in Sydney. Uh, of course, there's some additional offers that we do have uh, available to you and you will then get access to our um, uh, our account and channel managers as well. Of course, all D-Link products are available via a network of distributors, uh, both across Australia and New Zealand. We're available through both Ingram Micro and Synex. And in just Australia only, we've got Blue Chip Infotech, Edsys, Hills, Multimedia Technology and Pacific Datacom. Uh, we'll talk about this again at the end of the session, along with some NFR offers, which we have available for people that have attended uh, attended this session as well. Aaron, over to you. Okay, so we'll start off with, uh, your router is your network sort of core. Now there's different ways to set up your networks obviously, but basically in this example here, we're gonna have a network router as the gateway to the internet. So on most networks, routers are the default gateway for accessing the internet. On the router there, we have separate interfaces. We've got a LAN interface and we've got a WAN interface. Obviously you can't have the same subnets on both interfaces. So we need to route between them to allow the traffic to flow. The communication between your local network and your internet is done by IP routing. Different subnets, you need to route them via IP address. So we need a router, a network router to do so. On your private side, on your local area network, you will have typically DHCP. I'll just get my little laser pointer here. So on, on your local network, you'll have DHCP enabled. Now that stands for the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And it's normally, well, it's normally enabled on the, uh, on the LAN side. And you can have different types of subnets, including 192.168, 172, 16s, 10.0s. We'll go through a few more examples in a moment. And basically you can have a different range. Well, the range set up of DHCP. In this case here, we've got a configuration section of our DSR. We've got a DHCP and, um, server enabled within this subnet here. We've got a starting IP address and an ending IP address. I like to reserve a portion of the subnet for DHCP, the rest of it for static devices. The default gateway here is for all the devices in that subnet and that's where your routing for your traffic is going to go to. And we can do your DNS servers, so primary and secondary. We can also do this per VLAN. Every VLAN should have a different subnet. We can do different DHCP servers in different VLANs. So with DHCP servers, sometimes we want certain devices to be connected to a network, obtain an automatic IP address, but we want a reserved IP address for that device. That'll help later in port forwarding and also you know, network diagnostics and accessing the device, or if it's a server or a printer and you wanna keep it with a certain IP address. We can reserve that IP address according to a MAC address. And this is available on all VLANs as well. And it's a basic function of a DHCP server. And we can also do IP to MAC port binding. So that IP and that MAC will always have the bind. And it stops people from, um, with duplicate IP addresses, causing you a lot of grief. So on, on your local network, we have examples here of a 10 range, a 172, a 192.168, and these are the ranges you can have on your local network. On a public IP sort of network, we have a different set of IPs. This one, for example, on the WANs port is 23.1. We've got a bit of a googly server here. We've got some different IPs on different servers in relation to web hosting. And the main thing is here, private IPs are not routed on the internet. If you do see private IPs on your internet, it means someone's doing something rather wrong or dodgy. 
So normally in firewall, we exclude these from the WAN interface. Now with 4G networks, private IP addresses, technically will appear on your WAN. So we have in relation to here, a mobile network device. This is a 4G modem. And on its WAN interface for the 4G side, it has a private IP address, 10.64. But this is supplied by the carrier and the carrier will net this and share that public IP address over here with another 5,000 other mobile users. So if you had to do any VPN connections or uh, port forwarding, you require a real world um, routable IP address, whether it's dynamic or statically assigned. It's easier to get obviously a um, dynamic version, but you will need to change the APN details. Now that's access point name details within your 4G modem device. And you'll have to put in um, probably most likely account codes on your SIM cards so that you're talking to the correct type of network. So, well, yes, it is possible for a mobile connection to have a public IP. It is difficult today because uh, we have run out of IPv4 addresses. You know, it's um, normally a service you will pay for. And normally you contact your account manager to obtain it. Uh, if you require a list of APNs and account codes for most ISPs, give me, give me an email and I can provide you with well, the ones I'm familiar with. And that'll help out definitely. Because if you've got a VPN, you need a proper IP address. So with Australia, we have quite a few different types of internet connections. Um, we have a national broadband network, which is very interesting. So we have everything from FTTP, that's fiber to the premise, and then to the node, to the basement, to the curb all using different types of routers and modems. Now, fiber to the premise, your modem is configured, well, it's provided by the ISP, that's the MTU. The node being VDSL, you can supply your own, but you need a modem. Okay, um, we've also got business fiber optic. We've got ADSL, VDSL, cable, satellite, 4G. And these are all the different type of terminations you'll have. So, no, we have a question come in, Phil. Yeah, Aaron, just before we move mm. on, and maybe you can go back to the, the, the previous slide where you've got some 4G stuff on there. So, Owen's mm -hmm. asked the question, uh, how is uh, how's that different from a fixed IP mobile service? Certainly, this is a fairly hotly debated question yes. as to, I've got a 4G or a mobile well, service, do I need a, a public IP? Do I need a static IP? A fixed IP mobile service should be a publicly routable IP address service. That's normally, and they'll normally give you a different APN to use in your configuration. It may be like Telstra.extranet, or it may be um, uh, Telstra.internet, but with a special code on your account. So you may get dynamic IP, but it'll be routable. Maybe even Telstra.corp. That one in particular will give you a static IP address, but you've got to have the right codes on your account and pay for the service. So hopefully that clears things up. Yeah. Owen, feel free to shoot through another question if you've got anything else that needs following uh, up on that. There's certainly a... Um, uh, it's, a oh, yeah. it's, it's the most common thing I, I personally get asked. Every week I'm answering some sort of question in relation to either doing uh, port forwarding, or VPN access over 4G, and that will require a proper routable public IP. Yep. Yep. So I'm right. just follow yeah, up from Owen. Uh, is there a, is there an advantage for one or the other? So I guess the probably the follow up question for that, um, uh, Aaron is. Um, oh, definitely an advantage to have need, a real world public why IP. Why do I need it? Why do I need a, a public IP or a static IP? Oh, de definitely better to have a real world public IP. Then you then you're not limited then you can do port forwarding. Then you can view your cameras. You can use a failover with a VPN connection. If you don't have a real world public IP address, well, then you only can use the 4G SIM card as an internet service. Okay, there's a question here from, um, from Arun. 
uh, with uh, mobile networks, I can understand the carry gives out a private IP address and then it does NAT, network address translation to the internet. So to do VPN, can we do double NAT in the mobile router? Not with a CG netted um, IP address, a carrier grade net. No, if, if you've got carrier grade net enabled, as in like you're getting, you're getting a public IP address, yes, but you've got a private IP address on your device. But that public IP address is shared with 5,000 other people. So you can't do the port forwarding, nor can you uh, enable a, um, a secure VPN tunnel because the endpoint disappears. So you will need a real world IP address, whether it's dynamic or statically assigned. It's to be able to do, uh, to be able to do VPN. Do VPN. Okay. All right. So there's certainly, uh, certainly a lot of, um, it's a pretty regular question that, that comes up and I think oh, it's, it's very, very uh, common. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, I think, you know, this is one of the great things about these sessions is that we're, um, I'm happy to, happy to take these questions and I guess yourself, uh, mm. and David Urbano, we are two pre-sales engineers that cover uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, are happy to to talk to any any partners, any customers at any given time to uh, to give some advice. So we'll flash your details up at the uh, at the end of the, at the end of the session today. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Aaron, for the okay. question again. No silly. Yeah, with all these different today. types of oh, sorry. Okay, you know, with all the different types of internet connectivity, this is how we connect them up. We've got modem routers. These modem routers have built in DSL modems. Now, being ADSL, VDSL, that they're contained in those, we have a routing device here with Ethernet ports, Ethernet LAN, Ethernet WAN. And here we've got LTE routers, 4G, so 4G radios to Ethernet. And these are all the different features, the DSR series here, USB, we technically do have USB, Ethernet, built-in Wi-Fi, that little apostrophe there means the different series, that particular one there does not have built-in Wi-Fi. Okay, Aaron, couple of, um, a couple of um, comments that have come in. Uh, Malcolm yes. from, uh, from Lower Hutt, good afternoon to you. Uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, they're um, now referring to an NTU as an ONT. An oh, yes, terminal. yes, 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 yes. Uh, and look, we do apologise if today's session is coming across as uh, fairly Australia-centric. Uh, oh, yes. Certainly, um, uh, that's certainly what the team here at, at D-Link Australia are, uh, are very familiar with. So, uh, apologies to our um, to our friends at the Search mm. uh, that um, if if we're not quite getting all the terminology uh, that you're using. Okay, uh, it's another question here from Felix. Uh, just again regarding um, um, uh, 4G uh, and uh, um, public or static IP addresses, uh, is the routable real world address typically an extra cost option? Always. <laughs> I, have, I haven't, well actually sorry, I have uh, been told a couple of times where they have got it included for nothing, but typically yes, it's an extra expense. Yeah, I think uh, just um, going through this exercise uh, with Optus just in the, in the last, yeah. in the last yeah. week or so, I think, <laughs> I think their cost for that is, is, is around $5 a month for that, uh, mm. for that address, which, mm. which is pretty, which is pretty low cost. Yeah. But yes, okay. yes, if there's some way to charge it for something, they'll do it. Ab absolutely. Thanks, Just thanks Felix it. for their question. So, connecting routers and modems. We can do it via Ethernet. So if you had a fibre termination, you will have a device with an Ethernet out, plug it into the WAN port of your Ethernet router. We can have a DSL device, ADSL, VDSL, phone line into a modem, modem, Ethernet. In this case, this modem sitting here in bridge mode into the WAN port of the router. Unless you have a modem router combined, and then you have both in one, which will give you the LAN out. And we have, just for this example, coax. So we've got your HFC, cable coming off the street into your HFC modem. 
Ethernet out into your router. Also, with this, we, we couldn't fit it on the slide, but there's yeah, the fiber to the curb. There's, um, there's a device that they give you. They run a uh, fiber into a pit. They supply you, it's normally terminated by a Nokia fiber concentrator. It then sends signals over your phone line for the last 10 meters of a run to your house. Proprietary device takes that phone line, gives you Ethernet out. So, because our, our internet in Australia is fantastic, we typically recommend you get a backup device for it. In this case, we're showing you an example with failover using a 4G modem. So we have our primary connection going into WAN 1, and we have a backup device going into WAN 2. And that's available on our DSR series. And so as soon as the primary fails, secondary kicks in, according to how you set it up, but yes. Uh, just on that note too, there are some ISPs in Australia that do supply you a 4G SIM card in their um, modem router gateway device. Don't try and pull that SIM card out and put it into an external 4G modem like this one, because it will be put on the naughty list and you will find it'll stop working. And then you'll have to bring them up and get it reset. That is a common question that comes in every week as well. So with load balancing, we can do WAN 1, WAN 2, so WAN 1 being your normal primary, WAN 2 being your secondary. We can have it two versions of a load balancing here. We can do round robin and spillover, and that'll increase your available bandwidth to your LAN customers there. I will show you the options for this and all the different types of things we can do at the end. But it'll um, give you fault tolerance, one for failover, and two for balancing the load between the two LAN connections, or WAN connections. Uh, yeah, we have a question a, here, LTE backup is very useful. I would yep. say yes, it is. Yep, thank you for that, George. And George has got a follow up um, oh, yep. question to that comment. Uh, do D-Link have external antenna and extension leads to connect to the gateway? We don't sell them directly. I can give you recommendations of where to go and what to do. Um, the, the main thing is you want to keep those leads very, very short because you're going to introduce a lot of loss. But look, uh, yes, uh, send me an email offline and I'll um, go through all the available things for you. I guess the other thing to consider there uh, as well, Aaron, is the, uh, uh, is, the, is the types of frequencies that those antennas that you're looking uh, purchasing to make sure that uh, they support the uh, all the appropriate uh, either uh, bands or the uh, radio frequencies in particular the 700 megahertz band is absolutely the uh, is absolutely the one that um, uh, that you want to be ensuring that that antenna mm. um, uh, that antenna supports so 700 megahertz band is used uh, both for um, uh, Telstra 4GX and Optus 4G plus uh, if any of you attended our 4G uh, webinar that we uh, held back in April or May, uh, we certainly uh, expanded uh, into uh, the benefits of the 700 megahertz frequency. Essentially, you get significantly more range and uh, uh, in regional areas, uh, which of course equates to better performance and within a metropolitan area, uh, that mm -hmm. equates to better in-building uh, performance uh, and signal strength uh, as well. So certainly a gotcha to have a look at the antennas that you're getting, look at the frequencies that they're, um, uh, that they're supporting. Uh, a comment here from, uh, from Adrian, uh, that yes, absolutely, we would agree with this as well. And certainly uh, we've uh, had a lot of um, uh, people look at combining uh, our 4G router, in particular the DWM312, in addition to the DWR921. Uh, rather than using a, uh, another vendor's um, uh, UTM to have an integrated uh, 4G module uh, in that particular device. And of course, a lot of those devices are installed inside a wiring closet, which uh, typically will be right next to a lift well inside a high rise tower, lots of concrete, lots of reinforced steel, which does lots of um, um, uh, good things to um, RF, to radio frequency. 
uh, absolutely, it may well be cheaper to extend uh, your, um, your network cable uh, to yeah. that particular uh, router or modem router to a better location. But yeah, yeah, if you can put your modem as close as you can to the antennas, yep. and then just extend it out with a cat, cat cable, yeah, yep. definitely better. Yep, no, that's a good... Also, too, there's a, there's a very good website, the RFNSA, which will, you can put in an address and find out what towers you're communicating with at what frequencies. That's also very handy to use. But uh, yes, if you want to message me offline, I'll send you all the details. Great. Thanks, Adrian. Aaron, continue. Cool. Now, on the routers, on the routers WAN port, we can set it up to be all sorts of different um, authentication techniques. We can have it PPPoE, dynamic IP, static IP. Uh, there's quite a few other little versions I'll show you as well as options during the live demo. But yes, different internet providers require different types of authentication. So we have the ability to do that on the WAN port. It also leads me to mention VLAN IDs. Now, some ISPs require a VLAN ID number on the WAN connection. Now, from memory, I believe IINET and TPG sometimes require uh, VLAN ID 2. I've also heard of Dodo requiring VLAN 100 as something different. But we can simply just turn on the VLAN tag and punch in the number. If you don't do it, um, it won't work on certain ISPs. Oh, and um, there is a, another ability too where they can put the, say, IPTV over a different VLAN on the WAN port as well. That's also very functional. So, opening ports on a router. Most people have done this in the past. If you're not using a VPN connection, we open the ports on the router to communicate with some devices. So, in this case, we have a DSR firewall sitting in the middle, uh, and by default, it blocks all incoming connections until you start opening up ports. But if you establish a connection from within inside your network, it'll allow a return path of data. That's normal communication. So in this case, this computer is gonna talk to Google. Happy days, goes through the router to Google, Google responds back, and it goes through the router. So that incoming was allowed, because we established it from the inside first. Now, if we want to come back in and have a look at that camera, we are stopped at the firewall until we open up a port. So, when we're playing with port forwarding, um, typically, first things first, you need to know what port number it is. Now, this list of ports here, these days are normally blocked by an ISP. Um, I've seen a lot recently that are definitely blocked and also too in relation to having a real world public IP address. You've got to have one of those first for a start. Now, I, I, I personally use Aussie Broadband. Um, I use a business account. So I have a real world static IP regardless. But a lot of my mates are running the you know, a public, uh, normal everyday version of an internet service through Aussie they will automatically put you on what they call a CGNAT, which is the um, carrier grade NAT. So you're going to get one of those private IP addresses, not a public. So it's internally, so the, the, your port forwarding isn't going to work and your VPN is not going to work. With at least those guys, you ring them up, five minutes later, reboot the, reboot the modem and you've got a proper IP address. It, it will be dynamic, so which we will get dynamic redirection services later, but um, once you've got a real world public IP address, then we can start opening up ports. So common ports, port 80, websites, 443, remote access to normal devices, FTP ports, mail ports, mail ports are normally closed. And in this case, this is one of our DNR 2020s, one of our camera systems, the web interface on it is on port 80. Personally, just a personal thing, I like to change my port numbers high because when someone's doing port scanning, they don't normally bother scanning the entire port range. They will scan just the immediates like these and then the first, I don't know, 10,000. I like to use up sort of 32, 7, 6, 9 and above. The ones that aren't in use by normal stuff but normally don't get port scanned. Although in saying that now, they probably will be. 
But here, we can set a rule. So in this case, this person wants to connect with the NBR. It gets to the WAN port, so the public IP address on that WAN port. We've got a rule that port 80 is forwarded through to the local IP address of this device here. And then we have communication. Now, when we're doing camera systems um, or anything you want to do port forwarding to, it's better to either dynamically reserve an IP address for the device or statically apply an IP address to a device because then your rule will always work. As soon as that device changes IP address, well, then the rule's going to stop working. And I see that a lot with cameras, a lot of people who try and set them up. So setting up a rule in our DSR series, we go to the firewall rules. We say from the insecure WAN, because it's, you don't know where it's coming from. We want HTTP, in this case, port 80, going through to the IP address of the NVR itself. And obviously go always allow. That there relates to anyone on the internet accessing the device. Otherwise we could single, single it out or we'll put a range in, log it to make sure that we're actually making it work, then hit apply. Now with that public IP address, when we have a dynamic IP address on a WAN port, it's going to change. It's going to do this type of scenario. Probably every eight hours, that type of, that type of range. I've also heard some, some Optus people will have the same dynamic IP address for six months. But uh, you can't tell. So we have a dynamic DNS service in built into our DSR series where we can say when this IP address changes, update the DNS service and we can refer to it as a name. So in this case, mycameras.dyndns.com and that will relate to our current IP address. When that IP address does change, our DSR will update the DNS service. So all you do, you keep referring to it as a name, but this number will be automatically updated for you. Now those services, um, there are some free services out there. Um, I personally use, oh, there we go. I personally use the Dyne service. I've had this for, oh, oh, since I first started, many, many moons ago. It's not expensive. It's at, at the moment, it's about $99 for two years and you get 30, 30, um, 30 names you can put in there. And a lot of people I know will get this account and also sell the name with uh, their camera systems. So it's a reoccurring revenue for those people. So. But that's a, that's a very, very handy thing to do. Now you can also put, sorry, just jump back a bit. This dynamic DNS service does exist in our DSR series. It also does exist in our camera systems and some cameras. So you can put it into multiple devices. Just to put, don't put it in, don't put the update schedule too far because, oh, too much, because you probably get uh, banned. And with this particular service here, that's your login details there, or your account name. The password, you should be using the generated security key. If you haven't and you're just using your account password, I'd seriously suggest changing that. And that key can either be a really long one or a short one. So you've got the option to change. Just, to, just while we're on uh, cool. dynamic DNS, questions come in from Sergey. It would be great, or a comment, it would be great if D-Link uh, would have its own uh, DDNS service to be used with our routers. We, we used to have it. Um, it, it yes, yes, we, we used to have it in the past. Um, but the service, um, I wouldn't say was being abused, but it was uh, becoming out of hand and it was costing an awful lot of money. So, uh, yes, unfortunately, we've had to uh, cease the uh, dynamic service. We do recommend you. There are other free ones out there you can do. Um, but yes. Yes, but we, we actually did it in conjunction with Dyne as well in the past. Okay, so it is something that you do need to uh, you do need to pay for. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I'd, I'd recommend just getting this. It's also it's a tax write-off. So. 
Yeah. A uh, question here from mm -hmm. uh, from Michael uh, is uh, no IP uh, also natively supported as well. I won't say no, but I haven't checked. Um, so I've just yeah, done. Yeah, if you me an email, I can check on that for you. Actually, yeah, I, I must admit, I was I was unfamiliar with that acronym there, Michael of uh, of uh, of NOIT. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that for ages. I forgot about that one. Yeah. yeah so uh, just a quick a quick Google search of that. So uh, no IP is a free dynamic yeah. DNS and managed DNS provider, trusted since 1999 with a hundred percent uptime history. Mm -hmm. so, um, I used to use that in the, before I paid for my dine service. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, we'll we'll have to have a look into uh, we'll have to have a look into into that one for you, Michael. We will come back to you on that. If anyone else is interested in that, then uh, please shoot my uh, myself or uh, Aaron an email. Okay. Also, because it's a firewall, we do SPI, so stateful packet inspection, builds a state tables, multiple state tables. So as the packets leaving and coming back with the data, the two states verified if it, one's been tampered with discards the packets so that, that's from the network layer all the way up to the application layer now this is your osi layer so you've got your layer one to layer seven and we go from three to seven so spi is supported in the firewall and in most things these days but um yes it does connection state source port destination port protocol type source ip destination ip so if anything's altered on the way through it will physically drop the packets so it is a protection highly recommend that in today's environment geez but it also extra functionality in our firewalls we have the ability for web content filtering in our dsr series uh, it does require a license but we can apply this and we can get active content handling. So we can scrub ActiveX and Java applets. We can do static content filtering. So we can have good and bad lists, so white and black listings. And we can do dynamic content filtering. Now, dynamic content filtering is subscription based and it's done by Content Keeper, other databases we use. We cache the categories locally to speed things up. So with that, that's a live service. No need to download the database or maintain it. Global, no additional equipment, no complex configuration that's not hard to set up. We optimize it by doing the category caching on our end. Uh, and if you if it's not if if the website's not in the list it will then go into the list and then be analyzed and then you'll get a result. So it's very, very handy. Now, also too, if, if you do find a website that is categorized incorrectly by Content Keeper, um, I'll show you there's a website, you put in the URL and they'll go and reassess it for you, which is very, very handy. But what we've done with the, whoops, with the categories, we've split them up into 32 groups. So we can take the fun out of your internet by simply flicking a switch. We can just simply go adult gambling, game sites, crime and terrorism, personal beliefs and cults. We can just turn it off. And you will be either presented with a timed out page or you'll be presented with a blocked by D-Link page, which is a, a very, very handy thing. I will um, go through that with you, uh, all the different categories and the flicking the switches and the what to look out for with the license actually. So with the Routers for business section. We've got DSR250Ns in the really entry level. I'd be looking at the DSR1000AC personally. Uh, we've got AC1750 on it, dual band. That's a service router that we're basing everything on today. 4G modems. 4G modems is gonna be released in a couple of weeks with a different cat rating. So we get a bit quicker out of that one in comparison to the existing one. And this is 950 meg throughput from Wanderland. So we've got the processing power in there for you. So I will jump into my live demo here. Uh, change my screen. 
uh, with our trusty support engineers who is uh, online watching the webinar today has just uh, just shot me a note and yep. indicated that uh, no IP is supported by uh, uh, on our DSR uh, series of uh, uh, series of products. So uh, services. Uh, so in addition to no IP, dynamic DNS. Uh, free DNS, uh, 3322.org, custom, and uh, ORA is also supported uh, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a few different uh, providers that we work with there with different um, uh, dynamic DNS services too. So, thank you, Michael. We all, we all learn a few things uh, there today. Thanks, Edwin, for um, your diligence in sending that, us that through as well. And it's good to hear that he's watching. Yes, indeed. So, we should be able to see my DSR 1000 AC interface. I will just log back in there because I've got a time down because I've had it there for a while. Waiting, waiting. Okay. So, first things first, we will look at the network setup with DHCP. So here, we can see our DHCP server settings on our current subnet. Now, I've had to do 10.0.0 because I've got six VLANs all in different ranges, and unfortunately, that's the only one that I have available. It's not going to conflict with me. Here, starting IP address of 1, ending in 254. Personally, I wouldn't normally set it up like that, but for demo purposes, we have. And we simply we can change put domain names, lease times in there too. Don't make that too short unless you're running out of IP addresses. Now, reserving IP addresses, it's as simple as going into here, adding in a new reserved IP. Say maybe it's maybe it's a printer, and we want the IP address to be 100, and then the Mac. Obviously, it's not going to be this MAC address. I never want another one. And we can even associate with that and log drop packets as well. So that'll give us an indication if someone's got a duplicate IP address. And just simply hit save. And so next time that printer turns on or you reboot it, it will get that static IP address that we've just set. So that's um, a very simple thing to do. Now, if we wanted to do it via VLAN, see, because this particular router can do VLANs, under VLAN settings here, I believe I might have set one up yesterday, VLAN number two. So you just simply go oops, down here, add new VLAN, and then you get these details here. So VLAN ID, the name, the IP address of that VLAN, and here's the DHCP server setting. And we can put the ranges in, your DNS servers, lease times, and also the same with goes for reservations. If we want to reserve an IP address in that range, we can do it the same way we did previously. That's as simple as that is. So now setting up the WAN side of these things. Now, WAN 1, we've got WAN 1, WAN 2, WAN 3. WAN 1 and WAN 2 are what we're concentrating on. In this case, it's dynamic. We do have the option for static, PPPoE, L2TP, PPTP, Japanese multiple PPPoE, and even Russian dual access. We support everybody. And from that, port speeds, MTU settings, interesting thing to play with if you are playing with MTUs. Uh, DNS sources, you can look, see this, get dynamically from ISP. I prefer to use these DNS servers myself. And then if we have to put a VLAN tag, because we're on Dodo, for example, 100. Same with, we can do the same thing with WAN2 settings. So when, when, when you're doing WAN, uh, WAN failover and load balancing, Set up WAN 1, set up WAN 2, then we'll go into the other settings. 
same deal with here. Like WAN, WAN 2, for example, we could even make it a hardware DMZ if we wanted to. And again, same settings, which is very easy to do. Which leads me to failover and load balancing. Oh, we're here. So you've set up WAN 1, you've set up your WAN 2, and from here, we can say the WAN mode, instead of being a single WAN port, mind you, we can use WAN 1 by itself. We can use WAN 2 by itself. WAN 3 is technically a USB dongle. Here, we can say auto rollover using WAN port. So when WAN 1, see that's the primary. So when WAN 1 disappears, it'll kick over to WAN 2. And it'll do the health check according to DNS service or ping these IP addresses. Personally, I'd use ping these IP addresses. Then you can at least put, you know, I think it's up to three different IPs. And then you can uh, at least, you know, because uh, sometimes um, say your ISP had a bit of an internet routing issue, their DNS settings may be right, but uh, and accessible. So this may not fail over except there'll be no traffic. So apart from that, we can do load balancing. Now, when we do load balancing, it doesn't take WAN 1 and WAN 2 and join them together to one big pipe. We do it in such a way that you can balance between the two. So round robin, we'll take the first data session, send it out WAN 1. It'll take the second data session, send it out WAN 2. Third, WAN 1, fourth, WAN 2, and so on and so forth. So round robin. Otherwise, we can do spillover mode. In this case, we can do, if the load tolerance hits, in this case, 80, with a max bandwidth, it'll kick over to the other WAN. So it's, um, it's very customizable, very, very customizable. Now, when health check, we can do ping these IP addresses. Ah, there we go, there's the three we can go. That's always a very, very handy thing. Right, well, it's as simple as that is for fan, WAN failover, but opening ports. So we've done our WAN configurations, doing a port forward, not too difficult. So security, Firewall rules, because it's a firewall, it's a rule in the firewall to open a port. And here, we say, we add a new rule in, and we say from how? Insecure WAN. So that's your internet interface, because it's insecure, to your secure LAN. Now, if I want to do a port forward to VLAN 2, I can select it in here. I can go VLAN. And the other VLAN I've got in here is two. So I can do port forwards for individual VLANs as well. Service. Now, there's a pre-configured list of services in here. Everything you could nearly think of. But like me, with my custom range, my 32769, for example, I would create a custom service first, and then it appears in the list in the bottom. And then we go, Source hosts, now this is the internet side. So any single address, we can lock it down to one IP address, which would be pretty interesting. Our address range, log it, and destination. We can go, oh, actually now what I'll do, I'll pop this back to that. Any, always allow for a start. The internal IP address, say that printer, and I can hit save. It's as simple as it is. It's um, not hard, like I'll, I'll just I'll take a FTP. Just for the printer, maybe I'm gonna FTP a file to that printer, for example. Now, just a word of advice here, if you are setting up port forwards in our DSR and you see this, enable port forwarding, that doesn't mean turn the rule on. That means, or should say, enable port translation. 
If I flick this, I can then say, instead of being port 21 that this FTP is, I can make it be port, I don't know, 80. So I can hit it externally at 21, it'll be redirected to 80. And then hit save. And then um, do your open port check tool. And that'll um, show you whether it's successful or not. So that's as simple as port forwarding is. Now, with dynamic filtering, web content filtering. You have to be just before we go into Ooh. that, there's yes. um, a question here from uh, Arun. Uh, can I do traffic shaping if I want to make uh, SMTP? Yes. Use WAN2 and HTTP traffic to use WAN1. Can I do yes. this? Yes, 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 you can. You most definitely can. I won't, I won't go through it here today, but yes, you can. You've got to put in, um, where are you? But yes, you can. You can even, oh, yeah, the, the amount of individual customization you can do, it's, it's, it's insane. But yes, you can definitely do the traffic shaping. Um, and in fact, the last time I used it was on a Telstra fiber service where it was a 50-50 link and we had to traffic shape both up and down to be 48 meg because if you hit 50 and above, it would affect the upload. The upload would suddenly change from 50 meg down to five because they, they couldn't do the shaping on their end and they saw you exceeding it so that they limited you. It was very, very strange because that 50-50 that connection was technically 50 down, but 150 up, which Telstra couldn't control. So if you went over the 50 limit, then it's suddenly you're uploading at five meg. So we said the 40, 48, 48, that was fine. So yes, yes, you, yes, you, you can definitely do what you're after. So there's a lot of, um, uh, so uh, anybody's certainly able to, uh, uh, to do this. So if you go to, uh, the um, dlink.com.au or dlink.co.nz uh, pages. Uh, if you were to search there for DSR 1000, uh, for instance, you can go to that product page. If you then click on downloads and all downloads, you'll see uh, a whole lot of different documents that we've put together, uh, which cover uh, a whole lot of these things that are, um, uh, that are being spoken about. So in particular, uh, there is a setup guide there for uh, setting up load balancing on both the DSR 1000 and the DSR 500 AC. Just in that WAN failover one, uh, we do have some excellent how-to documents for setting up in particular 4G failover. Uh, if you were to search for, uh, to look at the uh, DWM 312 4G router, and I'm sure when the DWM 315 starts shipping uh, as well, that will include these how-to guides uh, on there, uh, that um, there is a document, a step-by-step -step document to take you through not only setting up um, the DWM 312 and DSR 1000 for failover, uh, but also with a whole host of other vendors, uh, UTM or Unified Threat Management Appliances, vendors like uh, Sophos, Sonicwall, Barracuda, Fort uh, Fortinet, and uh, and watch guard. So there's some great um, uh, there's some great content which is uh, which is available there. Uh, it's a question uh, that's just come in from uh, from Zoltan. Uh, good morning to you from the uh, fr up in uh, up in Queensland, Zoltan. Um, a port checking tool. Is there anything that we uh, that we recommend there? Oh, it looks like you're one step. Well, the um, there, what I normally use is can, can you see me? Okay. You able to zoom your screen in a bit there, Aaron? Um, yeah, we no, um, yeah, just normally go to uh, canyouseeme.org. Okay. And that'll, um, yeah, and just type in the port number and as long as you've got it open and something active on it, happy days. It'll just say success. Okay. Uh, if there's... A a couple of questions that have come in, Aaron. I don't know if you want to take these at the end or take these in the middle of your um, uh, the uh, the live demo. Well, this is actually the, the last section of the live demo, so okay. I'll just quickly get this out of the way. No problem. Now, web no, content please, filtering. Please take your time. Oh, well, thank you. 
Um, Web content filtering requires a subscription license. So you have to obtain one from us, pop it into your license update section and apply it. Now, word of warning, set your time and date first because your license is applicable on a 12 month period. And once you've done it, you're gonna have a hard time changing the time and date. So once you've popped it in here, we simply go to network, we go to static filtering, oh sorry, security, web content filtering. All right, we turn it on. Once we've turned it on here, we can then go to dynamic filtering. And this is where we take the fun out of the internet. So here, non-managed action. This means whatever you're not managing down here will be allowed. So in this case, they're all allowed. So now we want to take the fun out of the internet. We can turn that one on and that one and this one. Oh, of course that one. And you just choose the categories you're after. Like um, oh, even that one, oh, unfortunately that one. And then we hit save. And once we do that, that will be now filtered. Um, I, I won't, I'm not gonna hit save because I was doing this the other day and I kicked myself off the internet because <laughs> it actually does work. So that, that's as simple as it is. Now, if, if for example, you had no, a URL. I don't, think, uh, I don't think everybody here wants, uh, wants me taking over and, uh, and no, giving no, everybody no. a technical presentation. We'll try to put that. So we can override too. So we can do allow override and a timeout of 30, uh, 300 seconds. You would do that for testing purposes and then turn it off. But say, say something is categorized wrong, you may be going to um, news.com and you've turned off investment sites. Then you can go to these guys. Yeah, Content Keeper, other people who do the engine behind it, you can pop the URL in here and submit it and they will reassess for you. Because obviously there's billions of websites out there and so they have to you know, keep an eye on most of it, but that is their job. And they can get reclassified rather quickly. So I'll just jump over to here. So any questions are in the way, my bad. Okay. Okay. So, uh, question here from uh, from Adrian. Probably more of a more of a comment more than uh, more than anything else. Yes. Yes. So, uh, DWM three one two does support uh, a maximum throughput of up to one hundred and fifty uh, meg, uh, but uh, of course uh, we can't pass one hundred and fifty <laughs> meg of traffic through a ten one hundred Ethernet interface. So yes, very good uh, observation there, uh, Adrian. Uh, certainly one of the, um, uh, the reasons that we've got a product like the DWM315 coming out, uh, which is quite an exciting new product, uh, does also have a, an Ethernet WAN interface uh, on that particular device, as well as the ability uh, to uh, connect to an antenna for uh, GPS uh, tracking on that particular device uh, as well, and of course uh, it does support a uh, some faster speeds, uh, some faster speeds too. Uh, the uh, 315 will also have a gigabit LAN on there, so there's not going to be a, uh, a throttle uh, on that particular one. Um, so yeah, I guess the question is, uh, you know, is there uh, indeed a hundred meg uh, of capacity that the 4G carrier is going to be able to consistently uh, provide you? Uh, as well, but yeah, it's certainly um, an observation that you've made there, which hasn't gone unnoticed by the, the team at, uh, at Bailey as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael, uh, another question here, uh, do we support open VPN? Uh, and the answer is on that one is uh, yes, we do uh, also support uh, open VPN. Thank you, Ilya, for, uh, for that answer. So that is natively supported on all of, uh, on all of our routers. Okay. Um, yes, you can easily whitelist a website. When, uh, when I was in the static content filtering, 
Um, you've got the whitelist and the blacklist. So, yes. Okay, great. Thank you there. Okay, question here from V Quang. Uh, can I load balance a LAN port and uh, port forward a VLAN? You want to load balance a LAN port? And can I load? Can I load balancing LAN port and port forwarding VLAN? Uh, we can definitely port forward to a VLAN. That's no dramas. Um, I'd have to get clarification on your load balancing on the LAN port. Okay. All right, Vikwang, if you wanted to get in touch with, with Aaron shoot us an email. Uh, uh, directly on that one uh, or shoot through another question, um, just a bit more uh, clarification needed there on that one. All right. Uh, here's a tangent from, uh, from Felix. We love tangents here at, uh, here at D-Link. Uh, do we, uh, is there any, um, uh, a utility that we might recommend for network management? Wheelhouse, Aaron. We've got the uh, the DView, uh, the DView uh, software product. Where I was going with that. Yeah. So that's specifically yes. uh, well, that's mostly encompasses our range of uh, our range of switches. Mm -hmm. Aaron, I think I'd be right in saying that. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. If you go to um, our website and follow the prompts to DView, yes, there's a whole a whole kit and caboodle. It's now it's free up to the first twenty five nodes as well for you to uh, use. So a node is, uh, is... I was about to say, a node is a device. So it's a device, a switch, okay. Yeah. Yep. An AP, that type of scenario. Yep. Yep, so go and have a look at the uh, DView product. You can certainly go and download uh, that. DView 7 is the, uh, is the latest version of, uh, of, that particular, uh, of that particular product. Uh, probably one of our, I guess, our unsung heroes in our range. We, we are you know, probably as guilty as anybody. Uh, in not actually talking about that uh, that range of uh, that range of product uh, enough. Okay, uh, so uh, Aaron says here, can I check traffic flow from WAN to LAN? Um, so, for instance, I might have a port forwarding uh, to uh, defaulting to uh, port three three eight nine, and I might want to check if there's any attacks happening from any one or many WAN IPs, so I can block those WAN IPs. I would turn the log on the port forward and then turn on the logging function to a separate server for that information, because that's a lot of information that comes out. And our, our logs, and yeah, ultimately, yes, yes you can, but you've got to do it via log. Um, the logs overwrite themselves with every 500 entries, so first in, first out unless you pipe them off. And we can do that with that. You can pipe it off to a server. So. Okay. Uh, Richard, good afternoon to you, Richard. Uh, the content filtering URL to submit a website for uh, review. Get a, a content keeper. So contentkeeper.com? Yeah, just go to content keeper and then go to the support side and then there'll be reclassification URL as an option to click. Okay. Uh, Jeff asked a question. Uh, will there be some nucleus routers soon? Yes, Jeff, there will be. Uh, we're hoping that uh, they will be here, uh, be here before Christmas. Uh, certainly inside a, uh, a beta version of the uh, nucleus cloud product, uh, we can see some provision for uh, nucleus routers in there. So uh, they're not too far away. We're uh, as eager as you are to, uh, to, to see those. Okay, question here from uh, from Aaron, from your old mate Lachlan. Um, uh, will we will D-Link be releasing a business grade VDSL modem? Uh, I, there's certainly no plans to release that, um, uh, and I guess one of the reasons for that is uh, VDSL is uh, certainly not a uh, a widely used uh, piece of technology uh, all around the world. So it certainly presents a bit of a bit of a challenge for, uh, Sticking for point, yes. countries like Australia. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately not. Uh, it has been on our on our request list for uh, for quite some time. No uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, Malcolm asked a question here. So this is just regarding the uh, failover. Uh, so, um, uh, will it fall back or fail back to the what you've set up as the main or primary WAN connection once service has been restored? Yes, it will. 
Okay. Is there any um, any special um, a checkbox that you need to uh, that you need to select to do that, Aaron? No, because you've set the primary as say WAN one. Well, that's the primary. So when the primary is back online, it jumps back. Yep. Okay. Uh, Aaron asked the question here: Is there any place to uh, check the uh, what's going on with uh, live traffic in the router? Well, on the status screen, you've got a few things showing you like HTTP, FTP, the types of traffic going through it. But that's uh, it's more, more of a simplistic look. Okay, I think the answer to this one is no from Sergey. So, uh, is it possible to add the reclassification URL uh, straight to the routers page to make these requests quickly and easily? No, no. Yeah, so that's something that's got to be submitted through to uh, through to Content Keeper. Yeah. Normally, normally if you put a web link or a button or an auto update type of function to something else on the internet, it ends up getting hacked, and then they pull it down, and then we got to rewrite new firmware to put the new links in. Yeah, we've been through that quite a few times with the auto update buttons. Yeah, hence why we don't have the auto update anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess the the uh, the the site if it was causing some problem that you could you could look at whitelisting that site for a period of time and are submitting that site to content keeper mm. okay another question here from sergey uh which type of vpn service supported by dsr uh, is most secure in your opinion uh, and which one will we recommend uh, is the vpn client available for it well we support Flop. Well, yeah, we got uh, yeah. Um, send me an email. We'll go through that. Yeah, that's rather long-winded answer. But look, L two DP is my personal favourite. That works. It's simple to set up. Works with all generic uh, Windows-based integrations. There's no special client required. Okay, I guess it's probably a bit difficult for us to give a uh, you know I guess a um, a recommendation or an endorsement. Uh, mm -hmm. Of a product that's not uh, that's not made by uh, that's not made by us uh, as well. Not wanting to uh, take the wimp's way out, but um, uh, I guess a little bit challenging for us to uh, for us to do that uh, as well. Uh, and Adrian, just in uh, in um, uh, in in response here to our uh, DWM three one two with the ten one hundred um, interface only uh, marketing speak. Yes, yes, possibly. That's uh, that's that's the way the product is at the moment. That's what we've uh, that what uh, that's what we have. But um, yes, it is limited just to a hundred meg uh, interface there. But I guess rest assured, if you've managed to get a hundred and fifty meg from your carrier, we're going to give you all of that uh, all of all of all of that all of that throughput that is um, uh, that is there. Okay, if there's any more questions, please feel free to shoot those through. Um, what you will see uh, post this webinar today, uh, if you can just go back to the previous slide, Aaron, oh, sorry, jumped in. Uh, is you will get a, uh, um, an email asking you to complete a survey. Uh, and if you do uh, complete the survey, you will receive a coupon code to be able to go and purchase some of these products that we've spoken about uh, today uh, at some fairly, uh, some, fairly discounted, uh, some fairly discounted pricing particular a really good deal on the DWM 312 uh, at 67% uh, off RRP at $330. And there is also a bonus offer uh, of our DSL G225, uh, our VDSL, our VDSL mm -hmm. modem. Um, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's not a uh, business grade VDSL product, uh, but we are including one of those uh, with any of our DSR series of products uh, as well. <laughs> so, but they work very good in uh, bridge mode. Yeah, of course, that device goes into uh, bridge mode, which uh, uh, disables the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, which, is on that, uh, which is on that device as well. So I complete the webinar uh, post survey that you'll get via email and you'll get a coupon code for those offers as well. So, if you're not yet signed up to our partner program, we'd certainly encourage you to do so. There's a lot of resources that we have available. Uh, certainly, as you can see here, uh, all of our partners get access to our um, level two and level three priority technical support team uh, led, by, um, uh, led by Ilya. Um, 
uh, and his team of uh, support engineers are based out of our support office here in Sydney, Australia. Uh, please do go and get signed up to our partner program. Great discounts that are available to help you to be able to make money when you're selling these products to uh, our business grade products to your customers. So at either of those URLs there and uh, we'll get that process for you very quickly. Uh, there is also uh, some rewards that you can earn each month for, um, um, uh, for purchasing um, uh, just 2,500 Australian dollars uh, of, uh, uh, of dealing business products. Uh, there is a rebate that is available there. Of course, all of those purchases are made through our distributors uh, to whom we really um, I love working with in both Australia and New Zealand, Cinex and Ingram Micro, and just in Australia only, we have Pacific Datacom, Multimedia Technology Hills, Edsys, and Blue Chip Infotech. So I'm just gonna flash up our contact screen uh, with all of our key contacts. Uh, so certainly we're very much here to support our partners and our customers uh, across both Australia and New Zealand uh, with channel managers, uh, in, uh, uh, in all the key uh, regions supporting all of the country. Uh, in Queensland and the Northern Territory, based in Brisbane is Bernie Reisenberger. Uh, supporting New South Wales and the ACT uh, is uh, Michael Crocombe, who's based in Sydney. Uh, in uh, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia and Western Australia, there's Colin Chamberlain, who is based in Melbourne. And in New Zealand, uh, we have Paul Batchelor, uh, who is based in Wellington. So please take a screenshot of this, uh, take a photograph on your phone. Uh, this is certainly um, the uh, absolute must have details here for you to get in contact with your local uh, D-Link representative. Uh, both uh, Aaron Bilton's uh, details, Aaron based in Melbourne uh, are on there along with David Urbano, pre-sales engineer as well, based in Sydney. Uh, these guys are available. Uh, for all of your pre uh, and also post sales uh, questions available for site surveys, uh, whether it be wireless uh, or IP surveillance, that can be done both physically uh, and also predictively, and certainly questions regarding uh, network design, uh, in particular with regards to switching, VLANing, uh, and so on and so forth as well. Uh, in addition, you'll see over on the left there is our partner priority support number. Uh, in both Australia uh, and also in New Zealand, New Zealand over on the right hand side, that does come into uh, our support team in Sydney. Uh, please, that is the number to ring uh, for any business grade product uh, to speak to our team and to, uh, to jump the queue and to not have to answer uh, lots of um, um, very basic preliminary questions uh, <laughs> where there's a um, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of assumption there that a whole bunch of testing and so on has been done to get to the point where you actually need to uh, reach out to and to contact our uh, partner priority support number. Uh, of course, all of our training and certification uh, is online. These courses that we're running at the moment are in lieu of uh, the um, uh, classroom and face-to-face -face training sessions uh, that we do usually run uh, all across uh, Australia. Uh, we do have some online courses available. There's three which are available to do. Uh, um, our Nucleus Connect, Nucleus Cloud, and D-Link Network Design Associate courses. All of those courses can be accessed with the following coupon code of D-Link CERT 2020. That's D-L-I-N-K-C-E-R-T 2020. That's the coupon code for all of those courses. Uh, please, um, uh, please feel free to share that with your team. Certainly the DNDA is a great place to start, whether uh, it's for a technical person or for a salesperson, there's some great uh, agnostic content and material there for people to get an idea of all of the uh, types uh, of networks and types of products which connect uh, to networks. That's around three hours uh, of self-paced video with a exam at the end of that as well. Okay, we don't seem to have any more questions, uh, any more questions coming in at the moment. So I'd like to thank Aaron uh, uh, today for taking us through uh, in, uh, to giving us a good idea in terms of what a router does and, uh, and an overview of the D-Link for Business range of uh, routing products.
Thank you very much, Aaron. My pleasure. Any questions, reach out. Contact details will be. Uh, and a question has just come in here from Mark. Mark, this uh, video uh, will be available <laughs> on our YouTube channel uh, with, uh, uh, in fairly short order. Uh, you'll be able to get access to that. Uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, you search for D-Link Australia or D-Link New Zealand, go to playlists and then find webinars and you'll find all of our webinars there. So this webinar will be called Routing Technical Session 1 uh, or something like that. Aaron, as always, uh, it's great to get some of that fabulous information that is in your mind uh, to get you to, uh, to get you to share that with us today. So thank you for making everything so clear uh, and succinct and so on. We really appreciate having you as, uh, as a part of the team. And I know that your partners and our customers very much uh, appreciate working with you as well. Very good. Thanks, Phil. Pleasure. Well, it is a good day from uh, Aaron and myself, and we look forward to joining you uh, in, uh, in three weeks' time uh, on October 22 for session two of routing uh, with myself and with David Urbano. It is, uh, we wish you a good day, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next session.